Welcome back. Uh, this morning I decided to take a look and check out uh, the Phoenix Framework Project. Apparently it's all the rage these days, and I'm not entirely sure why. Um, I hear that it somehow enables more functional programming sorts of paradigms than Rails did, and so that this is a desirable thing to upgrade to if you're upgrading from Rails. Um, but that aside, I don't really know much about it, so let's dig in. How is Phoenix different? It brings back the simplicity and joy in writing modern web applications by mixing tried and true technologies with a fresh breeze of functional ideas. Um, it leverages Erlang VM uh, to be able to handle millions of connections. That's cool. You see, these are all the companies, or these are some companies that use Phoenix. Um, so, let's suppose that we want to get started with Phoenix. Before we begin, begin, take a minute to read the installation guide. Okie dokie. Sure, why not? And overview guide, we got to look at the, f oh, there's an overview guide? I see. Overview, installation, learning, and community. Let's start with overview. Overview. Phoenix is a web development framework written in Elixir, which implements the server-side MVC pattern. That's model view controller for those unfamiliar. Many of its components and concepts will seem familiar to us uh, who use Ruby on Rails or Django for Python. Um, Phoenix used, provides the best of both worlds, high developer productivity, and high application performance. So I guess you're not writing low-level code, but somehow product, uh, developers can still remain productive doing stuff. If you're familiar with Elixir, great. Um, there's a number of places to learn. The aim of this introductory guide is to present a brief high-level overview of Phoenix, the parts from which it's consisted, and the layers underneath that support it. Oh, I gotta watch a video? Well, you said this is model view controller. I've seen Ruby on Rails before. I'll take your word for it that it's similar. Um, Phoenix is actually the top layer of a multi-layer system designed to be modular and flexible. The other layers include Plug and Ecto, which we'll cover right after Phoenix in this overview. The Erlang HTTP server, Cowboy, acts as the foundation for Plug in Phoenix, but we won't be covering Cowboy directly in these guides. Uh, Phoenix is made up of a number of distinct parts, each with its own purpose and role to play in building a web application. We will cover them all in depth throughout these guides, but here's a quick breakdown. The endpoint handles all aspects of requests up to a point where the router takes over. It provides a core set of plugs. Okay, so that's their term, plugs. Uh, I assume their term requests, uh, term router. So I should keep track of these terms. So the endpoint handles all aspects of requests up to the point where the router takes over. Uh, handles a core set of plugs to apply to all requests. Dispatches requests into a designated router. The router parses incoming requests and dispatches them to the correct controller slash action, passing parameters as needed. Helps uh, provides helpers to generate route paths to URLs or resources defines named pipelines through which we may pass our requests, and pipelines allow easy application of groups uh, of plugs to a set of routes. Pipelines allow easy application of groups of plugs to a set of routes. So I see they didn't choose to call that a plug group, but a group of plugs, or multiple groups of plugs. Fine. Um, Controllers provide functions called actions to handle request. Actions handle or prepare data and pass it into views. Actions invoke rendering via views. Um, and actions perform redirects. Okay, so where's the functional points? If actions. Wait, you're saying that an action is a function even though really it just causes a side effect. It's not like in the mathematical sense a function. 
it's more in the programming sense of function. Okay. Views render templates act as a presentation layer and define helper functions available in templates to decorate data. Templates. Channels. Manage sockets for easy real-time communication are anal analogous to controllers, except that they allow for bi-directional communication with persistent connections. PubSub un underlies the channel layer and allows clients to subscribe to topics, uh, abstracts the underlying PubSub adapter for third-party PubSub integration. Okay, so I know you're saying that this is an MVC paradigm sort of thing. We definitely see here is the view. Here's the controller. Models somewhere in this whole shebang. Uh, I guess the model just gets passed around. Uh, anyway, Plug is a specification for constructing composable modules to build web apps. Uh, it's a reusable modules or functions that are built to that specification that provide discrete behaviors like request header parsing or logging. Because the plug API is small and consistent, plugs can be defined and executed in a set order, like a pipeline. They can also be reused within a project or cross projects. Plugs can be rewritten to handle, or can be written to handle almost anything from authentication to parameter preprocessing and even rendering. Phoenix takes great advantage of plug in general, the router and controllers especially so. So, <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, this sounds an awful lot like a concept I've heard in Java called an interface, where it satisfies um, each implementation of that interface satisfies the uh, the demands or uh, guarantees of that interface. I'm not really seeing what's so fantastic about this other than we're talking aspect-oriented programming. Well, not even. But we're talking uh, just interfaces in general. Uh, one of the most important things about Plug is it provides adapters to HTTP servers which will ultimately deliver application content to our users. Currently Plug is only an adapter for Cowboy. Um, I'm a bit confused. But yeah, composable modules being built together, like you're putting code together out of a whole bunch of building blocks. Um, and a plug just defines a way that um, of saying that these blocks fit with these other blocks. That's a really crude analogy, but I'm not seeing a I'm not seeing any higher point about that. Yeah, it's great that you can reuse them in general and use them all over the place, uh, and because it's small and consistent, um, you can. Uh, attach a whole bunch of plugs together and execute them in a set order like a pipeline. Ecto. Ecto is a language integrated query composition tool. Now, now we're talking. So here we get visibility to the model through Ecto. Um, this probably works quite a bit like the Ruby on Rails has capability to perform querying and so forth. Um, Basically, any modern program or application is going to have some sort of abstraction such that you're not writing a SQL statements, um, SQL being structured query language, sometimes pronounced SQL. Um, so yeah, we've got a repository, which is a connection to a database. We've got a model, which is the definition of an object in the model, um, defining table names and fields, which, as well as each field's type. Um, we also define associations. I mean, all these things are pretty basic or fundamental to any kind of modern application. Um, a change set declares a transformation we need to perform on model data before our application can use it. Not entirely sure what that refers to. Um, 
probably by default change sets just talk about if I'm using certain database types and they don't support native booleans then we need to cast from integer to boolean and cast back from boolean to integer when we persist data. Probably that's what it's talking about but um, actually that's yeah they say this includes typecasting this includes validations and and more whatever more means more means if you want to do something super fancy that you probably shouldn't be doing there I if I had to guess uh, check out the Phoenix guides github pull requests are happily accepted okay so that's the overview this sounds an awful lot like rails I'm not seeing what makes this distinct from rails um, bonus guides well I guess the only way I'm gonna learn what's different about this is to actually install it um, I'm not seeing anything about if you're upgrading from rails these are the new features you can look forward to probably just because that sort of documentation takes a lot of work to develop um, an overview guide we got a look at the Phoenix ecosystem and saw how the pieces interrelate you said it was model view controller I'm familiar with rails I mean there was no big surprises there but on the other hand there were no surprises there so what well, gives um, I guess the plugs are supposed to be something that's new to Phoenix that rails doesn't support and I'm not familiar with pipelines and rails so maybe rails just can't do pipelines I don't know or maybe it's just difficult or cumbersome to do so please take a look and make sure to install anything necessary for your system Any dependencies installed in advance can uh, prevent frustrating problems later on uh, Phoenix is written in Elixir etc etc here's the command to install hex if you have hex already installed it will upgrade hex to the latest version okay so we'll need the hex package manager copy um, if you, you've just installed elixir for the first time you'll need to wait where's the dependency list just give me the damn list I want the list can I have a list no why should I have a list okay so um, apparently I have to go here figure out because I guess there's no standard way of saying install something some set of all these packages for all possible OS's so I've got to do it this way uh, which is okay uh, it does not list Ubuntu 16 so I'm just gonna assume Ubuntu 14 hopefully that's okay Or maybe I search for this first. Maybe I search for Elixir. Apt search Elixir. Are we going to find it? Probably not. Dynamic functional language. Okay. I see that that's got some sort of package number 2015-0708. I don't know if that refers to the correct version or not. Um, so, you know, maybe we install it and then discover that it's the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, there's always Google, too. Uh, to unfull screen and then we say Ubuntu 16.04 elixir yeah now we're talking how do you install this whoa okay there's all your basic installation commands problem wait is this a success or is this a failure that a person's reporting almost certainly it's a failure but who knows um, oh hey look at that somebody made a script it's 
probably more advanced than what I need. Can I take a look at said script? And then if I want to search said script for the word elixir, um, I see. Well, that's a bit complicated now, isn't it? It's probably not how I want to go about installing this. Oh, never mind. Okay, so yeah, this is pretty straightforward, actually. So, it's suggesting that I take Elixir not from the main repo, but instead from this third-party solutions thing. I'm not convinced. I am not convinced. Um, so maybe I just go ahead and install, in fact this says Elixir Xenial, and Xenial is ROS, although all these are going to say Xenial, if that's how you pronounce it. Um, Yeah, so I'm going to just make the naive assumption that because there are no explicit instructions for this particular OS, I mean, somebody came up with a script and they say they tested it on all the OSs and it works. What does that even mean? Um, so since there's no real explicit instructions, I'm just going to do sudo apt install elixir. Uh, with a principle of least surprise and assume that this gets the right stuff. Um, okay, so let's take a look at what are these two things that um, this would have me install with it. Uh, Ubuntu FOP is something. What is this package? This package is an XML formatter for XSL formatting objects. That's wonderful, other than I don't think I need it. Um, but it says that that's worth considering getting. Um, is this a thing that's worth getting? The stream control trans... okay. You know what? I'm just going to install all four of those packages along with um, Elixir. Just because it's probably right that those are what I want. See, the problem with bringing along dependencies is that those dependencies have recommended dependencies as well. Um, so, no, I'll keep things simple for now. We'll include the man pages in the documentation. And that'll be that for now. And if we want more advanced tools, more advanced libraries, we can get those at a future time. I don't need this script anymore. Full screen this again. Um, yeah, I could use brew also because I've got brew installed for silly reasons. Um, Precompiled package, first install that. First install Erlang and then, wait. Compiling with version managers, compiling from source, installing Erlang. I think I've got Erlang in that. Yeah, Erlang is definitely coming along with Elixir. Um, so I don't need this, oh, hang on. It's highly recommended to add Elixir's bin path to your path environment variable to ease development. You will need to find your shell profile file and then add to the end of this file following line reflecting um, path to your Elixir installation. You're probably right. I don't know where Elixir slash bin is, but I can certainly do that. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's taken a while to install all the things. Meanwhile, I've got, I'm still uploading a video in the background and streaming. Um, so that's great. 
Um, so just have to be patient for this to finish. Oh, or I could read some of the instructions. Ha! Ah, imagine that. If you install Elixir for the first time, you will need to install the Hex Package Manager as well. The Hex is necessary to get a Phoenix app running by installing dependencies. And to install any extra dependencies we might need along the way. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Um, oh, but I should follow the final instruction here, which is find elixir slash bin first. I'll be surprised if the package won't make your Erlang and elixir binaries available. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, like, where is elixir slash bin going to be anyway? Yeah, and, yep, good morning. How about that? Um, so we'll wait for this to finish. And then we'll try to find where the elixir slash bin folder is. And I have an idea as to how to find that. So we say sudo update db. db with a b. And then we say locate elixir slash bin. And, oh, lo and behold, there is a user lib elixir bin directory. Which, in turn, means I need to black this out for one second while I update my profile file to add this to my path. One second there. Boop. Uh, dot profile. Oh. Apparently I don't have anything secret in my profile file anyhow. I thought I had all kinds of fancy stuff in there, but apparently this profile file doesn't have all that. So yeah, I can actually show this. Um, so I need to export path path equals that thing that I was just looking at that was in my copy buffer until I removed it, which was user lib elixir bin. So we copy that here. That's probably fine. I can add this back in. Um, that's great. And we'll copy this here as well. Um, and yeah, none of you saw any of that. That was my other profile file which might have had something in there, but whatever. Um, okay, so here's the command to install hex. So I have to install hex. Oh, I forgot to check. First, let's source our profile file and then call mix, just in case mix happens to be located in that path. You sure you want to install this archive? Eh, why not? I'm only doing it as a user, not as root, so what's the worst it could do? Um, I see, and it says creating dot mix, so meaning probably I need to follow this step anywhere um, that I might potentially be using this. Okay, so yep, we've now got Elixir installed. We can go back. Elixir code compiles to Erlang bytecode to write on the Erlang virtual machine. Without Erlang, Elixir code has no virtual machine to run on, so we need to install it as well. Well, guess what? We used the OS methodology for installing Elixir, which noted that Erlang was a dependency, so... Um, and instead of using this thing, I used the OS version. So that's cool. Um, yeah, the installation page incidentally didn't mention for Ubuntu 16 what to do, so I just did the naive thing. So that should be fine. Once we have those, we should are ready to install the Phoenix Mix Archive. A Mix Archive is a zip file that contains an application as well as its compiled beam files. Did you talk about beam up here? No, you did not. Okay, great. 
it's tied to a specific version of the application. Uh, the archive is what we'll use to generate a new base Phoenix application we can build from. Okay, sure. Phoenix mix archive and mix archive is a zip file which contains an application as well as its compiled beam files. So I guess this is building the Phoenix layer on top of the Elixir layer. Um, so that's cool. Or a Phoenix application that builds on top of Elixir, which builds on top of Erlang's VM. Um, if it won't install properly, we can download it from the archives and blah blah blah. Sure. So we'll give this a try. Go. Maybe. Sure, why not? Requires Elixir uh, 1 2, but I'm running on 110 dev. Okay, so point taken. It doesn't like the version that I installed. Meaning I've got to go back up and undo the naive thing. So I've got to do this. Wait, does this say Erlang? Oh, Elixir. So I've even got to go back up and get um, uh, make my own instructions in a sense. So I ignored these instructions because it didn't say Ubuntu 16. Um, turns out you can't do that. So here we go. Copy. Paste. So this gets the correct installer file and installs it. Or at least indicates that we're now able to install from it. And let me say sudo apt upgrade. It's probably not going to note that we have a dependency on Erlang something something. Um, zero upgraded. Okay, that was unexpected. Have I done something wrong here? Oh, I forgot to do update first. sudo apt update. So pull in the info from that remote repository. Look at all these wonderful repositories from which my OS is built. At some point I should think about maybe simplifying some of this. Incidentally, why can't it just do an update um, up in parallel across all of these repos? Um, you think that this could be multi-threaded somehow and it could ping all the repos at once. Do, 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 do. Well, that might take a minute. That might take a minute. Yeah, why? I don't know why this isn't done in parallel, or at least two threads at a time. That would double the speed at which this is accomplished. I do not understand. I wonder, have I lost my connection? Is that what's going on here? Uh, let's take a look. Uh, at least my connection with Twitch is up. So, this is still going. Come on. Uh, okay, so... We're either stuck on get number 32 here, or we're stuck on get number 33. We're probably on number 32, which is probably saying that we're just waiting on the server that offers up all the translations to say whether or not it offers new software that contains translations. I don't even know why that's enabled because I don't really have a need for that, because I speak English, and most software is delivered in English. Oh, I'm sorry, that says translation-en, um, which I guess means that... Um, <laughs> that's how Ubuntu chose to handle that sort of things, that 
Uh, English is just one translation among many. And there's no advantage to using English over any other language in terms of performance. Okay, here we go. That's better. 55 packages can be upgraded. Let's do it. Oh, I should have done dash Y just for laughs. Um, new packages will be installed. Packages will be upgraded. New airlines can... Okay. Yeah, that's probably fine. It's probably a stable upgrade path. Maybe. Stable enough for my purposes, I hope. If not, I'm going to have to reinstall things. Um... Okay, so I will also have to install SSL Air, or ESL Erlang um, and all of its applications, I guess. Oh, wait, no, this is probably already handled, um, given that in order to install Elixir, I don't know. Uh, does this include ESL somewhere? You know, I should just try the command and see if it tells me that it's already installed. That's easier than me looking and trying to find that among that mess. So understandably, installing 55 new or 53 packages um, is going to take a little while. Or I'm sorry, upgrading 53 and installing 10. So that's 63 packages being installed. I can understand why this might take a little while. And this is more complicated than the initial installation wherein I installed version 1.1 of Elixir instead of 1.2. Man, you know what would make these installations more epic? If, if this install script somehow included music. like. I don't know why I'm the first person, or if I'm the first person to think of it, but system administration would be a little bit cooler, at least for noobs, um, if the installers offered up like hold music. Now, granted, that's the one thing that would probably cause um, the installers to take even longer, plus any uh, competent sysadmin would have music at their ready. Um, but I just think it'd be amusing or entertaining in some way. Okay, well, let's let's take that out of the hands of system administrators. Let's say like with Windows users, just your typical user who has to endure through a Windows update. How much more awesome would Windows update or something of that nature be if they offered music? Come on, so we're getting there. We're getting there. Hey, Kaz. So, oh, the other thing I could have been doing this whole time, instead of complaining about how long it's taking, uh, is I could have been reading through the next instructions. That would have been a productive use of time. Um, I just know now if I go over to do that. This is going to complete. This is like the classic watched pot never boils situation. Imagine if you could choose one. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, well, you're dealing with Microsoft. It's, uh, I don't know. There's really not much more I can say about that. Um. they make something that functions just well enough that people are happy with it and they by happy i mean brand loyalty and they've got that so they must be doing something right even though if it ticks off users from time to time um yeah they've got an enormous market all to themselves so good for them, I guess. Um, but yeah, I'm saying just it would make it a little bit more bearable if something simple like hold music were integrated. Um, 
So yeah, we need to install Erlang slash OTP, whatever OTP refers to there. It's not topology. Um, I, don't, I don't think I saw the OTP anywhere here either. Operating system something something, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. We'll find out what OTP is here apparently just by doing the install command. And that probably won't tell us either. We'll probably find out halfway through developing an application exactly what it means. That's okay. Or I could just use Google. Um, oh, but we're almost finished. Um, now let's do a Google search. Erlang OTP means what? Uh, open telecom platform. Okay. So I guess that's what they use for streaming data. That's cool. Um, or streaming, yeah. I was gonna say calls or more specific types of data, but then you can know uh, you could use OTP for um, streaming any sort of thing. Okay. Well, we'll leave that up in the background. And go over here. Goodness, this is slow. Oh look, the call is asynchronous. Hooray! You know, honestly, I mean, you can show me all the code you want, and that's useful at some point, but if I'm just trying to grab the concepts, this is an excellent figure for showing me the concept. This is an excellent figure for showing the concept. And really, that's all you need to know. Because I'm not coding any of this just yet. Um, I mean, I can imagine what this might look like in code. You start something, you initialize, initialize the program, you allocate your memory, you define all your variables and values and such, you begin the loop, you spawn off threads as signals come into your program, and via sockets or via whatever. Um, and then when you get the appropriate signal, you terminate the loop and exit. And here's how it's done for Erlang OTP. Open telecom platform. Um, what am I doing with Phoenix Framework? I'm seeing um, just how difficult would it be to develop any kind of server for any purpose using this framework. Um, ultimately, it maybe, I doubt this is the case, but maybe it would be simple to port um, RelayChess to Erlang and to Elixir. And I'm sorry, not to any of that, but to Phoenix which could compile into Elixir and Erlang and stuff. Um, probably that would be a really difficult port, but um, for once I'm actually kind of curious what Phoenix is, what it has to offer, and if I ever had to make a server for any purpose, would this be suitable? Um, it'd probably be too much to do relay chess inside Phoenix. But yeah, this Phoenix framework's all the buzz. Um, I'm still trying to appreciate what makes it so much more buzzworthy than Rails, or equally buzzworthy. Um, it's a really scientific term, that. But yeah, I don't really have a, um, I, I don't have a hard and fast goal on this particular um, thing that I'm trying to do. I'm more than willing to say I'm setting a goal of doing the Relay Chess server thing in Phoenix, but if it ends up being too difficult, I'm just going to throw my hands up in the air and give up on it. That's kind of the position I'm in, so I'm not committing to uh, necessarily doing anything. 
other than just seeing like is this doable and if so what might it take to actually get this done come on come on come on any second now maybe I'm kind of surprised we're on Ubuntu 16 well okay so I'm not dealing with the graphical user interface but I would still expect that some shell kind of display like such as what I have here would be able to show you percentage progress over everything that you're doing um, I mean that seems like something that would be useful in general not just for when you have a graphical installer but even from the command line but apparently it's not necessary so they haven't bothered with it okay we're gonna see if ESL Erlang is installed um, Erlang syntax tools okay so I'm going to take a look at these. Um, Ubuntu 16. What it's probably telling me is that I have things installed that I don't need installed. <sighs> Which is my fault for installing that in the first place. Um, sudo apt remove this stuff this stuff is that going to take everything with it we'll see uh, so no we do not want to continue with that because so even though these instructions say that you want to install the open telecom platform um, I can't install this because it would conflict with other things which are installed and at the same time, uh, those other things are necessary for Elixir. So we're done. We don't need this, and we'll make do without it, and we, it's probably already installed somehow. Um, <laughs> yes, it's cheating. You wouldn't want to cheat. That'd be a horrible. Cheating would be the worst thing you could possibly do on Linux. Hang on. Uh, locate elixir bin. But first we have to sudo update db to have it know where all the files on the OS are. And then we have to look for elixir slash bin. Okay, it's now at user local lib elixir bin. Uh, so let's take a look at our profile file. Uh, and since I can't remember where that's at, there we go. Um, hang on. I want to copy this. Uh, come on. I want to copy this one line. And okay, now I see that highlighted. Um, I think this is the wrong directory, so yeah, I'll have to do one of those, and do this, and skip down to the end, and nope, that's not right. Okay, um, oh, so now I'm back as uh, user dandy, source my profile file. And then we execute mix out of that directory. Are you sure you want to install this? Sure, why not? Um, and we want to execute the same command. Not that, but mix local.hex. Sure, okay. Um, so we've already installed Erlang. We've already got the OTP stuff somehow and now we want to install using mix we want to get archive.install so we'll do that on both users 
Um, okay. If the Phoenix Archive won't properly install, we can install it manually. Plug, Cowboy and Ecto. We won't need to do anything special to install them if we let Mix handle their dependencies. As we create our new application, these will be taken care of for us. If we don't, Phoenix will tell us how to do so after app creation is done. Node.js is something I've already installed. Don't have to worry about that. PostgreSQL is already installed. I notify tools. Oh, that's nice. Wait. <clears throat> um. Yeah, let's see. How do I install this on Ubuntu? Okay. sudo apt install inotify tools. Um, oh, okay, so it's not recommending anything. It's saying this is a dependency, so this is going to be installed. So that's cool. Um, and then we can use sudo apt auto remove to get rid of um, old Linux images that are on our disk. Come on, come on, finish, 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 I tell you. Okay, there's all these other kinds of Linux frugalware, Arch, Source Mage, Rosa, Slackware, everyone else, compile it from source. Hey, look, this is last updated 2010. Or at least that's the last news update. When was this last updated, code-wise? Code. Last changed two years ago. Huh, how about that? And we got some notifications on GitHub. Use the default system compiler when compiling set setter. That makes sense. Cool. Um, auto remove. I should have used dash y to automatically execute this, but good enough. Um, so am I missing anything? Let's see, we've already got Node.js. We've got Postgres. I've just installed iNotify tools, which is really awesome. Um, kind of surprised that given that I have NetBeans, that I don't already have iNotify tools, but. I guess NetBeans doesn't automatically install that for you. Skeleton installation. Okay, sure. Um, Phoenix.new. Oh, there's no harm in doing that. And I think that's about as far as I'm going to take it here. Uh, so as soon as that finishes there, we've executed the installation section we can resume next time with learning um, I guess this is where you discover just how much of a pain in the butt it is to code things in a new language it probably isn't but it could be you never know so here's where you learn all the actual stuff that wasn't taught to you in the overview um, which wasn't in that handy dandy E, uh, Erlang OTP thing. Um, so this could use a better specification. Uh, at least they do explain testing down here, which is awesome. They explain deployment. Um, bonus guides. Um, man, okay. Phoenix is the thing. Isn't that awesome? Um, let's see, if we go to documentation. I guess the deal is that this is just so new that they can't produce anything more than this overview explaining it. Um, and they just focus their efforts on developing code and features rather than developing a comprehensive guide. And they do talk about these Phoenix guides. Oh, uh, wait. Wait, guides? Guides. No, user guides. Okay, sure. Up and running, adding pages, routing, controllers. Okay. The material here is still a work in progress. We're moving fast.
Sure, of course you are. Nobody has time to write documentation. Um, but at least there are resources. Maybe this is where the profit is and this sort of stuff. How great would it be if the only way you could learn a language is by paying people to teach you the language? How in the world would languages propagate if things work that way? That's beyond me. But sure, we're going to install phoenix.new. Hey, look, we got phoenix.new. Um, maybe I want to make my own directory or something. LS web. Uh, let's cd to desktop, cd to temp, and then execute this thing here. Oh, I see. We're saying phoenix.new space web. It's going to create that as just a directory called web. Yeah. Well, it's funny. You look at, there's one language in particular uh, where They've gone to enormous lengths to document this. And this would be Java. Um, uh, where was the documentation located? I mean, you can get started with Java. There's the Java 1 community, there's all that stuff. But more importantly, there's like the best documentation ever, and I'm trying I'm just, floundering to remember where it was located. Um, that's amazing that it's not like, okay, let's say Java for developers, software downloads, etc., etc. Training, partners, support. Man, why would they bury this? That makes no sense. Unless they really don't want to deal with Java Standard Edition anymore. But yeah, they've got all this fantastic documentation explaining getting started with Java. And explaining this from so many different perspectives. And this is all documentation that Sun, formerly, and now Oracle maintains. Explaining every possible question you could ever ask about this. And they're starting to do similar things um, with Java FX and Java FX2 and all so forth. Um, yeah, I'm I'm surprised that this isn't like readily hinted at or accessible from the pages I was just looking at, because this goes very deep in depth, um, explaining things like. Here's your introduction to using Java um, database connections, or JDBC. Uh, here's some of the basics. Here are all the things you could ever want to do when you're talking with a database. And then if you want to look at these things in detail, you click on that. And there's subsections here, and it redirects you to that. And if you have more questions, you can even select these things. And it's, um, issue Google searches, or you can sometimes drill down, um, and this will take you, uh, not there, that's a bad example. Um, is this going to take me back to? Yeah, it is. But sometimes they do provide you links to the API, and the API itself provides documentation. So, uh, Apparently here it's just going to direct you back to the generic documentation, possibly because JDBC is a more challenging example and there are multiple providers and each one does its own thing, so linking to the Javadoc doesn't make so much sense. But say if I had a question about Java API, Java Util Vector, you see this is like your top search results. Here's everything you'd ever want to know about a vector. It implements all these other classes and interfaces, uh, or extends this class, implements these interfaces. And if you're curious what clonable means, you can click on that. If you're curious what a character iterator is, you can click on that. If you're curious what a segment is, you can click on that. Uh, you can go to a char sequence. 
You can go to a string builder. You can go all over the place. And this is um, very thoroughly connected, tightly linked. Um, so contrast that with what we're looking at here, where this is a new language. It hasn't been around for a decade or more. So there's not much in the way of technical documentation that's methodically produced here. Each author comes up with their way, own way of documenting something. And I guess that's, I guess the minute they start documenting how this language works, that's going to define standards that they are compelled to follow. And maybe they want the flexibility to be able to change how things work at any time. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, this is really, this overview is pretty sadly lacking. And I mean, sure, you can show code examples all day long. Uh, you can show screenshots all day long. But until you start explaining some of the concepts, um, I don't know. I guess developers just have to be in the loop to understand what are the benefits of using this. If you're not in the loop, you don't know. I guess it's that simple. So. Maybe next time that I come back for this sort of Phoenix Framework stuff, um, we'll proceed through some of the learning and see if we can get into the loop. Um, until then, hey look, we got a successful Phoenix installation. Now to run my thing, I just have to follow what it says here and just do cd space web mix phoenix dot server. Couldn't they have just gone like f-e-n-i-x, like the StarCraft, no, never mind. We could not find rebar. Oh no. Oh, can I install it? Okay, I was gonna make fun of it for saying that I followed all the instructions to the letter this time and it still isn't working. But no, it, it actually obtains dependencies um, similar to how SBT does so. So, okay, it was correct that dependencies are automatically obtained as needed. Um, I'm not sure where it installs all these dependencies, and it, I don't think it's telling me. That'd be useful to know. Um, but whatever, we'll make do. It's probably installed into my local, or my users dot mix directory. And look, we're running web.endpoint with cowboy using http localhost colon 4000 meaning if if i could tell net to port 4000 um we would see something here uh let me try that uh, yeah let me just show that off because why not we've got We've got a minute to spare here. Um, let's see, can I get another window capture going? Add uh, window capture, capture window, window capture somewhere. Come on, there's like a million possible. Oh, there it is. Window capture. Window capture one. There we go. So, telnet uh, other machines IP address port 4000. We are connected. Huzzah! It works. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm actually going to end up cutting it here. But, you know, next time I return to do some of this, um, hopefully we'll see more than just a black box. Hopefully we'll actually grasp what are some of the concepts behind Phoenix. How do you use it? What does it mean to write good Phoenix code? What does it mean to write bad Phoenix code? I don't know. We'll grasp some of it, hopefully, next time. Until then, this is what um, Phoenix has to offer. It's fantastic. It's the best thing ever. Everybody go and use it. Have fun. See you next time.